What's up, guys? Welcome to the Books to Business podcast. Another crazy week going on in the world with uh, coronavirus and social distancing and all this stuff. But we have some good content coming your way to break it up. We went to the the archives for this one uh, because the emails we're getting in are overwhelmingly about how do I take control of my life? How do I, uh, you know, do business a different way? And I think people are going to be changing. There's going to be winners and losers in this uh, in this journey. I think people that make a change and are out in front are going to be winners, and and those that stay still and uh, go to status quo are going to have a hard time adjusting. Yeah, and this, it, I mean, it is back to the drawing board because these are companies, um, and we'll discuss the framework a little bit. Essentially, it's eleven companies that outperformed all the others over an extended period of time, going from good to great. And so we'll talk about the parameters and how he defines greatness. But these 11 companies did that, and they all had similar characteristics. They, they, a lot of data here to help paint this picture. And so some of them, like Circuit City in here, they, they don't even exist anymore. Right. But the principles are... I mean, I was shocked. It was, it was, this is one, like, so we read a book a week. So some of them, the expectations are high. You read it. It's like, eh. Sometimes they're incredible like this i didn't expect to be as good as it was this was like a life changer for me there's concepts in here i'll use for the rest of my life so it's a really really good foundation yeah this book's about uh, you know why why some companies make the leap and make the breakthrough and others don't and that studied um it didn't study success what i love about jim collins his research and his team is he studied contrast yeah he said that you know the, the the conditions were identical for all these companies during the time studied. So when one company had a success uh, in an isolated environment, he didn't study that. He studied the contrast. What made the the eleven companies that sustain this growth over a fifteen year period of time, three times that of the market, compounded? What made them different? And he talked about uh, science. That science offers predictability and a replicatable process that's a scientific method once you once you have something that works you know we talk about it in the form of algorithms but in the social world when you're dealing with people the the science doesn't necessarily hold true but he says uh the things that these good to great companies did and there was lots of them that did good here and there but these 11 did these six things to become great for a long period of time, yeah, which is replicatable. And you right. touched on an important piece, too. It's like these 11 companies, he pairs them each with a competitor that was in the same place at relatively the same time. Right. And the competitor either stayed the same or, or dropped. And, and um, over a 15-year period, the 11 that he said were exceptional, that were great, they were at least three times the market over a 15-year period. Um, period, right? They brought in that much per year. What what's I love about this timing is, you know, they say there's going to be a baby boom because everybody's stuck at home, right? Everyone's stuck at home together. That's what happened when they, they came home from the war. There's a baby boom. The baby boomers, all these people were born. I think it's going to be a business boom. People are like, how do I start a business? How do I, how do I uh, get online? How do I go virtual? How do I do lifestyle friendly? And the principles that we're going to go over here are the ones you want to start with. Like it couldn't be better timing to adopt these principles that are definitely relevant today. And we're going to go through them in uh, three buckets. The first one is um, a dis- three, these, he calls them disciplines. The discipline of the right people the discipline of the right thought and the discipline of the right action. Yeah. It's a really cool way to break it up. Yeah. So let's start with, with people. And these are the first two chapters. They're very, very powerful, very powerful chapters. So one of the things, and he says this wasn't even something that he expected when he did the research, but he found this when studying the leadership of companies. You know, what he calls a level five leader. Mm-hmm. Someone that is selfless, someone that's committed. Um, and when you look at these 11 companies, it's not the flashy, charismatic person. And it was either all cases or all except one. I don't remember. But it, was, it wasn't the flashy, charismatic guy brought in from the big blue chip company. It was someone right. internally who had mission first, um, who, you know, he calls it the window test, right? When things go wrong. He looks out the window, or when things are, are going well, he looks out the window and he, he says, it's because of my people. 
It's been, feel free to jump in if I yeah. butchered that. You have a look in your face like I might have. No, I'm, think, I'm just thinking about <laughs> this. Is actually one of the mistakes I made in my life. So I'm kind of like evaluating what you're saying in my own my own context. Basically, he yeah. looks he looks out the window, and when things are going right, he says it's it's because of a combination of luck and the amazing people around me, and the mirror when things are going poorly, right? When things aren't going the way that that was planned, he says it's because of me, and that characteristic alone you know, really helps build the camaraderie that's essential for a good company. It all starts with the, the leader. Yeah. The, the four, the, there was five levels of, of, you know, what makes up the great leader. And the first three are, you know, the right, they're good, good skills, good management skills and good team building skills. And then they have the leadership attributes, which you got to learn on the job and 90 plus percent of leaders stop there. Because most of the leaders, particularly the high level leaders that you've seen, if they've already done something big somewhere else, their passion may have very well died on the vine there. And when they go to a secondary company to do something again, they're, they're, they're living someone else's vision a lot of times and they're fixing something. So a lot of times these guys just flip it, you know, flip it over and, and make a quick, make a a quick, quick buck. Stock, you know, stock buck. But they don't, they don't go for the long time. The, the level five leader in this book, I mean, these are people you never heard of ever. Yeah. I mean, they're not written about. They're quiet, unassuming, typically homegrown people from within that have a passion to see what they started to finish. Uh, and humility was one of them. You know, one of the attributes of the level five leader, they were, they were, they, were, they had uh, no ego essentially. And then um, they also had the will to endure long, you know, to build something beyond their own ears that would be, still be there. That's an important piece. Um, it's be, it's, the company culture starts with the leader. So, you know, when he talks about a level five leader versus the other kind, right? The sort of more authoritarian, I'm the hero. There's two things that can happen. One, they can be effective for a short period of time, but they leave and the company sort of derails because there's nothing to sustain it. And two, it, it, even with that leader, it doesn't do well because they're so self-centered. Like a lot of these iconic leaders he's talking about, they wrote best-selling books about themselves. They wanted to be the center of attention. Right. And it's very, very difficult to juggle that and the priorities of a, a company. Yeah. I mean, one of the, Coleman Mockler was one of the CEOs. You've never heard of Coleman Mockler, but he was the one who, was, who brought the uh, sensor razor to Gillette. Mach 3, baby. And that was, I wonder if it's named after him. Mockler. I haven't used that thing in a couple weeks. Uh, <laughs> but it revolutionized shaving, and then there was a group of investors that tried to buy Gillette out for a quick flip, and he would have been very wealthy. And he passed, and for the greater good of the company, he made that the deliberate decision. Like, hey, this is for everybody. It's a long term. We're going to be preeminent. Yeah. And for in every case, for those that bailed, if they stayed with Gillette, Gillette was like one of the best performing stocks for the next 15 years, like 15 times the market. So that's about, you know, level level five leadership. So in your own leadership, here's the point is if you're building a team, it's not about you. It's about their success and look, look out and let them take the credit. And when then then take the blame yourself when something goes wrong, own it. Yep. I, and I this is a note too. Uh, we were just talking uh, outside. First time I've ever heard this in my life. He talks about char charisma as a negative mm -hmm. because it's so disruptive and so distracting and can dissuade people from wanting to chime in. And the um, what's the word I'm, I'm I'm thinking of? Where like it's like a collective. Everyone's putting in their input. Um, there's a kind lot of, of deliberation, yeah, okay. sure, versus just like a top-down type. Right. You know, people get swept away by charisma, and a lot of times led paths, led down paths that aren't beneficial to the group as a whole. And yeah, Ray Dalio's book talked about the idea of meritocracy versus the dictator dictatorial uh, flow down of an idea, and like everyone gets to put in. They're in a they're in an environment where they can thrive, versus um, others that didn't do well in the same exact environment. Yeah. Yeah. I, li I like it. it's a controlled one thing that is scientific about this book and this research. I was talking to Steve this morning and I said, that, you know, once you have the data and you see the data, the books are like almost e a little easy to write. The research is remarkable because they all had the same conditions. Yeah. It's almost like Navy SEALs. Everyone goes to the same exact place. They go in the water at the same time. They're asked to do the same level of physical abuse. And some people come out of it and win and others just fail. Mm. And this is what they did with the books. So they, and they took it, they, six principles, right? These are six, I think seven. There's seven principles that 
these companies, these 11 companies did to like not just win, but become great. And that's what's astounding about right. it. Like all the books we do, well, I won't say all, most, they're written by very credible people who've mm -hmm. accomplished a ton. Right. And so, yeah, I want to hear what they have to say and I'm interested, but there's always a level of bias and self-experience and all that stuff where this is like literally the numbers tell the story. Yep. You know, a team of researchers looking at the data, seeing the commonalities. It's just, it's almost refreshing. Yeah. It's very hard to find uh, stories being told today without it being drenched in opinion. Yeah, and I watched Collins. I always watch the keynotes. My algorithm from reading a book is to, you know, play it quickly, follow along while I'm reading, and then watch the keynotes. Or if there's a TED Talk, I watch it all. And he was Pick in up a, some nuance. Yeah, he was in TED Talk, uh, not a TED Talk, but a keynote, and he was doing his own principles for his research team. You know, they did everything. You know, without them, I wouldn't have this data to put this easy puzzle together, right? Yeah. Um, one thing that I liked <clears throat> that Eddie mentioned was the mirror in the window. What part that I liked in the book was he said, uh, the when it comes to success of others, he's really quick. The level five leaders credit the success to the other people, but when he's when something good happens that they can't find someone to pin it on, he he says it's good luck. And then the comparing companies say the opposite. They're like, whenever it comes back on them, they're like, oh, I'm having bad luck. They'll never take the blame. They right. never look in the mirror. So it's like, not only is it good luck for the top leaders, but the same similar leaders that don't do well say it's bad luck and they don't want to give any credit to anyone else. Well, anytime a company fails, uh, it's always leadership. It's like, oh, it must be leadership's fault. And it very well could be. Um, but there are other evidences of shortcomings that are pretty compelling that these principles will touch on. You, know, you have the right leader, right? And then, but then you also have to have the right people, you know, in the discipline of selecting the right people. Mm -hmm. And he has a principle called the bus. Yeah, yeah. So the bus and the what really makes this special is the the order of things, in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. So the the idea is you want to get the right people on the bus, which sounds intuitive. Any company you want the right people with you. But what Collins does is emphasize that it's not about the people; it's about the right people. And you want to fill that bus with people that have your back, that have the same vision before you even have an objective, before you know where you're going, before you know how to get there, because when you have the right people on the bus, mm. they're capable of adapting. They're capable of changing. They're capable of creating a new um, you know, life for the company. Um, so he really emphasizes that, and it's a unique way to put it. Yeah, he uh, talks about uh, who first, then what? Yeah. Which I love. Uh, the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. And then once you decide what you're doing, put the right people in the right seats. When you put a talented team together, you can do anything you want to do. If you have the right uh, capabilities and the right symbiotic um, environment led by the, the right leader. Mm -hmm. So the right people, um, you know, the right people focused on excellence. I mean, that's one of the, th and these people are not, not focused on just being good because good in this book, and, in, and I believe this too, is the en enemy of great. Yeah. You know, just like, um, I think distraction and clutter is the enemy of success. Like when you have too much clutter and distraction and noise in your business, you can't focus on what it is you can do. Right. What, what can you be, do better than anybody else? Which is another principle. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the hedgehog principle. Yeah. Um, so basically this idea is, and man, it's just so beautifully painted. He talks about the fox and the hedgehog, right? So we're talking about good companies versus great. A fox, is, it can do a lot, right? A hedgehog can do one thing. And so good companies are like foxes in that they're invested in a lot of things. There's a lot of moving parts, right? A hedgehog does one thing. A great company is incredible at one thing. That is their mission. That's their right. goal. And so it's almost like we can go back to books we've done previously, essentialism, right? Cutting away the stuff that um, right. is not important, finding that one thing that you can crush. Right. And the one thing. And the one you thing. You know, there's so many books about about that, uh, you know, the fox is kind of a tricky little, th they make it the result of many different ways and the fox, but the fox never catches the hedgehog because the hedgehog has one move that they're the best in the world at. The hedgehog, when in a dangerous situation and a predator is going after him, they roll up on a little porcupine ball 
and the, the, the predator can't do anything. They can't bite and eat a porcupine. That's all the hedgehog does to survive. And it's this one powerful move, and it's the best in the world at it. And so the, in the book and in life, you gotta, if you're chasing, you know, uh, my dad told me to chase two rabbits, they both get away. And I was surely not invented by him, but you can't be great at two things in my mind. You gotta chase one thing. And there's three circles that he, that he talks about, you know, this, they, and they intersect. And one of them starts with one thing that you could be the best in the world at, right? Like, if not the world, like it's unrealistic sometimes for, for someone who says, I want to be the biggest company in the world, but I, you could be the best, biggest company in your world, right? You can start in your space. You know, we're, we're actually going through that now. Like, mark, when you choose a market, like, I want to sell everything to everybody. Won't do as well as I want to sell one thing to this specific group. Right. So the first circle is uh, some of you the best in the world at. And by the way, you don't have to be at the time. Like a lot of companies aren't even in areas where they decide, you know what, we can be the best in the world here. They pivot. They completely transform their company mm-hmm. and they do that. He talks about, you know, sitting at the table with his wife and she puts down the paper and says, you know what? I think I want to I want to be an Iron Man. I'm, I think I can w- or be an Iron Man. Yeah, I can win Iron Man. And, um, you know, that's. She decided in that moment that that's something she could be the best in the world at. So, um, yeah. And then then it's something, the second one is, what do you love? I mean, what are you passionate about? That's the second circle. So let's pretend those intersect, that you love being an Ironman, and you also are very passionate about it, and you could be the best in the world. You have an outside shot at winning. You believe it yourself, or your class in your world, or the world, right? That's the second one. And the third one is, this is probably a bad example for Iron Man is what drives the economic engine because this is a business book. So what is the X factor that you make drives? a lot of money if you want to race? You could. I guess you could. I'm, I mean, I'm sure I don't know a lot about Iron Man, but all I know is every time I see it, I was like, wow. But those are the three things. And those circles intersect like the Olympic circles do. Right. They're all. And in the middle is is the um, you know, is what that one thing is. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, good. I was just going to say, you can't, you have to have all three. There's no, right? If you're not passionate about it, you, you don't endure the hardship. If you're not making money at it, you can't sustain yourself. If you're not the best in the world at it or one of the best at it, you're going to be outdone by someone who is. So it, it really is like you need those three working in unison. Um, like balls, balls juggling. We used to use that that metaphor. Yeah, you got yeah exactly. In the middle of it is is an important thing. It's one factor. One x. If x equals something, what x drives the economic engine? In my world as a financial advisor, right? I remember putting my team together after I read this book. I think it was sixteen, seventeen years ago. We said, well, what can we be the best in the world at? And at the time, we were a franchise. We had there was ninety franchises, and we were actually headquartered in Manchester, New Hampshire. So in finance in Manchester, New Hampshire, where it could be the, we'd be number one in the world at. And the one thing we came up with that you know we could we didn't have the, the, the amount of wealth they had in New York or Atlanta or Dallas or Boston, we didn't have the population, but we could hire. We ended up becoming very good at hiring. We became the best in the company in my mind, and statistically very close to that, if not that. that is we wanted to be the best recruiting organization in the world. And we started with our world, and the company we were with was probably one of the best companies in the world. So at one time, that organization was one of the best in the world at that particular discipline. Now, here's the, here's the mistake I made, is that I would tell people that I was the best recruiter in the world instead of telling everybody that my team was the best recruiting team in the world. That was an example where level five leadership did not happen. Mm. All transparency. So if I had to do it over again, I would step back and put them in the in the in the spotlight. Yeah, this this book brought back memories. Oh, I remember a lot of this book. I read it a long time ago, but I remember these principles because I taught them. Uh, of course, the, the the hedgehog principles. If you're starting a new business and you don't know where to start, you gotta you gotta pick one thing. Yeah. And remember, we went through that little thing. Like, think about a few different pieces of data. What do you talk about when you're not being paid? That's usually what you're passionate about. What do people ask your advice about? That's usually something that you could sell. What do, um, what have you been doing for the past 10 years? 
right? You start putting it together, you're going to come up with a short list and there's going to be circles that, that intersect. And then of all those things, what could you be the best in the world at? Right. You know, and what could you monetize? And that's the, that's the, the exercise you make if you want to go from, from zero to good and from good to great using these principles. Made that decision a bunch of times. Singing, filmmaking, voiceover, all these things. Like there's so many ways you could pivot, you know. And, and Colin says what takes most companies down mm -hmm. is not wrong decisions. It's too many options that you get bogged down and you lose your clarity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you have to cut down, you have to find that in, in the book, you know, um, Kroger versus A and P, right? Kroger realizes, Hey, people don't want, um, cheaper prices in the eighties. They want superstores. They want options. They want variety. Uh, Wells Fargo, you know, banking, becoming a commodity, focusing on the West coast. It's almost like there's relief in the simplification of, right. of, of strategy so you can truly align your resources and your people towards what matters. Yeah, Kimberly Clark sold their mills. They were a paper mill and they sold them. Uh, they sold the mills and got into their building their brand. They, they, they got rid of all the noise and was, we're going to build our brand. And then they ended up buying Scott Paper, big time uh, success. Walgreens started doing convenient locations instead of like numbers of stores. Right. It was a really interesting, uh, these are all very interesting, but when the head's where the hedgehog fits in. Like, what do, you, what do you do in one sentence? And who's your client and what do you sell them? Like, I sell life insurance to people who need life insurance under 40. Yep. Right. Got it. You sell life insurance, right? Or I'm a personal trainer and I help people lose weight. Right. These are all uh, simple hedgehogs. Instead of saying, you know, you just see a lot of people start to drift and confused buyers don't, don't, don't buy. And no one has more experience at that than us. <laughs> we try we try the same thing so we learn as we do these books right you learning steve yeah that hedgehog was uh probably the my favorite part of the book but the thing that helped too is that i'm always looking for something to build the framework be like okay that's it that's what i'm going to focus on but what he said about the hedgehog was it could take years to really define that hedgehog so that was that was something different as well i was like as soon as i heard it, i'm like oh i'm gonna do it i'm gonna write it out and i got it but it took years I guess that's right. Yeah, that's interesting. A lot of this, there's no such thing as a, as a quick fix in this book. Yeah. And there is no such thing as a quick fix that I've ever noticed that's replicatable. There are quick fixes. You can get lucky. Some people got lucky. You know, some folks got into the social media space first and early. They popped. Even bad, bad people did well. But that's not replicatable. You want to say, if you pick up this, this concept, you know, being a level five leader is replicatable. Uh, using the bus principle is replicatable. Going to hedgehog is replicatable. So in the first three, the first three principles in a pursuit of excellence, uh, you are looking at, you could stop the video right now and, and stop the audio and walk away and be very, very capable to run a very good business. But you could get better. Yeah. And, and to um, Steve's point, they take time. Mm -hmm. So it's not, there's no, there's no, um, like Colin talks about the, what people see in a magazine cover or something took 17 years to come to fruition. So all these little pivots, it's following an idea, the hedgehog mentality, um, and doing the right things, having the right people on the bus, having the right leadership, and just chipping away day after day after day. Um, and then eventually you're left with something that stands apart. But people, you know, it's like anything. People only see uh, the guy on the podium. They don't see him slaving they, they away. They see the uh, the chicken come out of the egg, he said. And then it's like, but you don't know all the processes that went on the egg to fertilize it and all those things. They just see the egg hatching. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like how he says in the flywheel thing. It's like compound. A discipline that, that I think you really need to be focused on, too, is when to kill something. And it's just not working. That's a very dangerous um, decision to make. You know, when you kill something and, and he, you know, the principles that he has is the, the concept of the Stockdale principle. Admiral Stockdale, James Stockdale, was a prisoner in the Hanoi Hilton, which is a Vietnam prison camp. He was the highest ranking prisoner of ever. And they tortured him brutally from 1967 to 1974, terrorized and tortured this poor guy. And actually, uh, McCain was also in the same prison. And he survived, and while others didn't. And 
the paradox in this is, you know, what was the big idea here? Well, if you asked, uh, asked him what helped him survive is he faced the brutal, the brutal facts. All right. And then he had the faith to, he had the faith to know that he'll endure. All right. And then he'll make this a, a defining moment, like the, the discoveries of a defining moment. So in the, in the, you know, in the, in the discipline of thought, you got people that are like real, and that's when you can say, oh, our hedgehog is X, but X didn't work out. Yeah. Right. I like to say head in the clouds, feet on the ground. Right. So like belief in an end product, 100% buy-in that it's going to work. But being totally clear and open to reality, not disregarding what's in front of you, um, learning from it, taking it in and using it to create your reality. Um, because where people get lost is they disregard what's on the ground. They disregard the reality in front of them and they make decisions based on, you know, to your point, well, I'm going to be out for Christmas. I want to see my family End goal right. family. And you forget like, no, that's, that's not the reality. And the companies that, that became great were very pragmatic in terms of the story happening in real time, mm. how they can approach it benefit from it and change it um so yeah the i, I love that i was talking about the stocks paradox all the time now it's like oh, we're in it we're in it right now in yeah. real life right <clears throat> we have a uh, we got we got a president said there's going to be 30 more days yep we're going to be in quarantine for 30 more days like isn't that unthinkable we've already been in quarantine for what two weeks or a week i think a, two a little over a week i don't know I, I mean, this is the, this is, look at the brutal facts. What if this happens for six months or a year or two years? Are you prepared for the long haul? Is your brain conditioned to have the faith that you'll, you'll, you'll get through it and the, and the discipline to confront the brutal fact that this could be a defining moment in your life? Right. Right. That's the Stockdale principle. What's the brutal truth here? It's 30 more days. He didn't say, and we'll all go back to work on May 1st. He said 30 more days. Right. And they don't like giving that number up. Yeah. We can hack it. We're tough. <laughs> yeah, we're hacking it. Yeah, we're making a lot of it. We're, we've, we've been more productive in the last two weeks, I think, than we ever have been. You By know. two or three times. Like, yeah, it's high. I, I mean, it's noise and minutia is all... I mean, granted, there are some sacrifices being made, but you can either dwell on that or you can ramp up everything else. We're doing the latter. Yeah. Well, there's some things you, we can't do. Uh, we can't do any any live speech speeches. Uh, we can't do any you know any travel whatsoever. But the things we can do, you make the most of it. Right. And that's the whole concept of what's the brutal brutal truth here. You better get really good at you know leveraging some technology to communicate over the phone. You better get pretty good at picking one thing you could be really good at that way that will endure no matter what. Anyone banking on Easter could be dead from a broken heart right now. <laughs> oh my god if they did that's right <laughs> going home for easter uh they're also you know that's a that's interesting it's interesting that you say that but a little rough but true the truth yeah the, the truth um so we got so we did people thought and now we're on action yeah, yeah. the last one discipline and we touched that touched on that a little bit to succeed your company needs the to be a hedgehog right now as you probably would have guessed it's not easy to be a hedgehog it takes discipline right and uh you know that's what he talks about that the idea of the don't do list everyone talks about acquiring and we talk about on this podcast all the time the, the mindset of i'm not where i want to be what can i get what can i add what can i acquire what can i build versus cut 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 and what i keep finding in business and everywhere else is that you should always be going there first. Like right. the answers are always in doing less. Absolutely. Yeah, making decisions, uh, cutting away. And, you know, decision isn't about adding something to your life. It's about cutting something away. That's what the word means, uh, you know, to cut away from. Decision, decide, D away from. Decision, cut. And, you know, the discipline of not to do things is hard. It's hard. You always see people drifting into, into, um, into different parts. When I was when I was a young manager, my job I was I, you know when you become a manager in financial services, you were once a salesperson, so you become a manager now. And when I the, the people I was managing, I was a way better salesperson than them. So I started, 
you know, going out on appointments and making the sales for them. And my, my, my mentor was telling me, he's like, no, no, you're not allowed to do that anymore. You need to teach them how to sell so they can go sell on their own. Mm. So he used to catch me doing that. He'd catch me on the way out the door. He'd like go through my, my books. He'd find a file and he'd make me go back in the office. But, it, you know, it's like you can't, you know, to have the thing work right. There's, if you wanted to be a great manager in this case, I had to be better at a different skill that, that, be, that made me a great salesperson. So you have to, you know, cut that away and become, just make a decision to become great at this and stop doing something else. You'll see that a lot. Exactly. The, the best companies, they put systems in place and they gave their employees, you know, they, they pushed an entrepreneurial spirit that mm-hmm. existed, you know, at the startup standpoint, but the, the limitation was the system, right? So the employees were, you know, should be themselves and felt free to be themselves within the confines of the system that was in place. Right. So the way Collins says it or articulates it is you shouldn't have to manage the people they'll be themselves. They'll bring their own unique talents and skills to the workplace. You need to manage the system because the system is what builds the company's identity, creates the discipline that allows you to be a hedgehog. Otherwise you go 90 million ways. You become a Fox. You see a, you know, a a light and you chase it. And that's just, that's what kills, uh, kills a business. Yeah. Oh yeah. Chasing too many things definitely kills a business. He did a, a, talked about Disney. Oh yeah, which I love because Disney has you know the, when you're in discipline you don't you don't drift from your core your core values, and like Disney went through you know the company's been around a long time, like he started with his core values that he wanted to inspire people he wanted to create a magical like uh, place for people to go in their minds to relieve anxiety and whatnot and then he wanted to do it with exquisite perfection and and uh, attention to detail, those were his core values and he started. You know, he started writing on a pad, like cartoons, and then he went into live cartoons, and then he went into theme parks, then he went into, what else does he do? Cruise ships. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, the company's a giant company, but it all started, they don't, never, they don't ever drift away from their core values. They're closed for the foreseeable future. I just saw that yesterday. They are? The park up the street in Orlando, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. I mean, imagine. I know they donated all their food. I mean, that place is a machine if you've ever been there. I mean, I've never been to Disney. For you. If you're listening overseas, it's a spectacle. Like a million people come into this little area, and you wouldn't even know it. they're all there. It's so perfectly run. I so have this idea clean. in my head that you just wait in line for four hours for a ride. So like, have you been? There was a Disneyland where I grew up in California, oh. but I've never been to Disney World. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, just... Oh man, I hate lines. That's you got to go when it's real hot in Florida. Have you been? Did, you <laughs> of been course, yeah. in Orlando. Yeah, right? it was. It is a lot of lines, but if you go when it's like down season, it's pretty. It's not bad. That's the way to do so it. So summer. Yeah, <laughs> when it's blazing. They figure it yeah. out though. They have systems. I mean, to to speak to this, their core values aren't compromised by the amount of people. I think they'll cap it when it starts to become like over overflow, which a lot of companies that could care less won't. Yeah, they just let them keep coming and taking your ninety bucks. What but was interesting? But, sorry, go ahead. It's a good, it's a, it's a good experience even when it's busy. You know, I find that it's yeah. very impressive that they never drift from, you can't find a piece of trash on the ground at Disney. Really? You can't find one. It definitely loses magic when you live there and you, if you go often. So it's definitely good to do I once. thought you were going to say when you were 30. <laughs> <laughs> that too. It's a little different then. You got to go. We should do a, a podcast up from Disney. We'll rent a family trip. You got a pretty cheap room up there right now, but we're only three and a half hours away. Uh, one thing about Disney that is interesting is the the experience uh, when you go to Disney. I hadn't been in a while, and I got close to the park. I parked very, very, very intricate parking system. You take a tram or a train to a place where you get off, and then you start getting close. You, when you get a little a little closer, you start hearing music. Yeah, one of the Disney songs, and you know you got then it, <laughs> and then then there's some smell that hits you from the food, Describe and then the it. colors churros. Uh, yeah, just something like that. Yeah, and then the colors <laughs> hit, and I sat there one day because I was reading all these books. I'm sitting there on a on a on a bench outside the park, and I'm seeing people like they're bit, you know wanting to beat their kids up, and they start smiling when they get close to the thing. You know, they've created a great, you know, obviously a great environment for people to experience. Yeah, you know, sight, uh, ears, and 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 sound, or and sound, or sound and uh, taste. They're really interesting. What I liked in the book that was interesting about the core value uh, was that he said that all the level f- level five leaderships or the great companies had core values that they stuck to, but they weren't the same. Like there was no 
consistency between which core values they had, which I thought there would definitely be some kind of correlation between a few, but there was like none. It was mm. just having core values. Yeah, the the core values were the same, and then they changed and adapted, you know, as everything yeah. progresses. And, you know, with regard to the hedgehog thing, which I guess is, is parallel to what Steve's saying, it's like there are companies that are hedgehogs in a specific area, and then there are some that are process hedgehogs. So, like, GE is a process hedgehog. They're in a bunch of different industries, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. way they they... Um, carry out the business, their core competencies are the same. So that's how he, he kind of juggles those two right. because there are some very successful companies that do a lot of different things, but right. their process, their approach, and, and the value they're providing are the same. Yeah, because Jack Welsh just died, right? Just recently. I remember one thing about his, you know, I read his book uh, a little while ago, but he sold companies that he couldn't be number one in. He sold a bunch of companies. GE had a lot, a lot of companies at one point, and then he's just started, if he couldn't be number one, I think one or two they'd sell. Is that the company that fired the bottom 10% over yeah, here? Yeah, he whacked everybody. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, what's, in, you know, what's good about that is no one ever sits on their laurels, right? Right. He's going he's gonna to get, uh, he's going to take out the bottom 10%. There's a lot of controversy around that. It could be someone totally capable. I got a question that's came in that's uh, similar to what we're talking about, which is what are the most common brutal facts in businesses you've run? Maybe that's for you, T. Any common brutal facts? One of them was um, no matter what you do, no matter what you teach them, them, and no matter how badly you want it, they may not still uh, succeed. Uh, that was one that was hard for me to handle. <laughs> That's tough, yeah. And then, you know, uh, my mentor said, some will, some won't, so what? Next, someone will. And you, you, you give everyone a chance to do it. You give them your heart. You get systems in where they can thrive. And if they're the right people on the bus, uh, they'll win. If they're, if they're the wrong people, you got to get them off. You know, they, you could think they're the right ones, and then you got to get them off the bus. So that was the brutal, that was the brutal reality. I have to teach that to my the folks that I'm mentoring. It's heartbreaking when you see someone and you really enjoy them. You should spend a lot of time together, and all of a sudden, through, through no, no necessarily, uh, like, no fault of your own, because you see others win in the exact same environment. Right. So it's a contrast. Same tools. Same training, same training room, same physical location. One goes off and makes a six and seven figure income. The other one can't pay their water bill. Mm. That's hard. It's hard. It's emotional. So you got to manage your emotions. Is one thing I used to say. Manage your emotions and manage your systems. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of in a different spot, right? My my biggest company I, I has three employees, so it's not like I've had teams of twenty or thirty. But the the most consistent thing is is clarity. Right. You know, that's that seems to be the obstacle that continues to reemerge, um, particularly because uh, a lot of it is more in the creative space. And there's just such a tendency to convolute things. So, you know, everyone asks me, you know, when, when it's what book, what book, what book? It's really, you know, two. The Martian, because of the trials and tribulations, I think nothing articulates it better than that. And essentialism, because of my own experience, I'll say this till I die. Cutting, 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 cutting has changed my life. That's funny because that essentialism is my first one. I'd cut it down to three. Essentialism and one I'm reading right now that I love is uh, Why. Simon Sinek's Why. Mm. You know, I, I think we'll be reviewing that book. I haven't read it yet. I'm yeah, pumped I, to read it. I've been listening to him and like my, my, uh, my teaching is, you know, decide and dream and line up your dominoes. So those are really three separate books. Essentialism is cutting away. Um, and dreaming used to be as like what you want to be. And then after I read Simon's material, it's like, no, first what, why you want to be it. Mm -hmm. And then what, why you want to live in a life like that. And then what, because a lot of people are in a, in a role right now that they, they, they got what first, not why. And then finally just lining up the dominoes, you know, lining up your steps. So books are, um, you know, books are, are something you can use to recreate yourself, brain, body, business. Um, it's hard to pick a book. Yeah. It is. It's, I mean, it's like, it's like different, um, different medications. It's like, well, what are you looking for? What's the problem? You have a cough, you know, <laughs> you got COVID. What? <laughs> Who said that? Oh my God. Everybody's <laughs> got it right. This book, <laughs> it, you know, this book is one you got to read if you're going to start a business just from the mechanics of, of the business. So if you're a level five leader and you have no employees, 
you know, prepare to be one. If you have the bus, right? And you don't, you don't necessarily have to hire people to start your own business because you're going to use, if you're hurting for capital, you're going to use um, freelancers and overseas people. So you want the right freelancers um, or the right contract laborers. And where Eddie and I and Steve, I think, kind of, kind of kind of fluffed it out here. We'll give you a quick example with your voice to the world, which is our prior name of our podcast. Right. Remember, we, we were like, what is that? You know, I, we knew what it meant. You know, build your business, share your voice and build your business. We knew, every, but every time I said it, someone says, what's it about? I was like, well, we use books. We curate books and we teach the concepts for business. And then Eddie's like one day goes, well, I'm going to just call it books to business. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what the, you know, that's the. Uh, Quick rebrand. Yeah, that's what we have. Simplicity. It's you know, impossible like, to, to not understand that one. It's not very crowded space. Um, but, you know, we, just to talk about being the best in the world at it, you know, we do one book a week and there's people doing it, but not in this format, I think. So we can be the best in the world at, at, at helping people be in business using books as a guide. Let's put it this way. Books to business, when the URL is immediately available, you're either innovative and you're about to change the game or everyone knows something you don't. <laughs> so we'll find out. But it seems, you know, I, I believe strongly in this. I feel like there's yeah. nothing more powerful than, than a foundation of reading, learning from, from mentors, you know. Well, I host a, um, a private Facebook group with, with uh, 400 industry-specific people that are very low engaging. You can't inspire this group for some reason. I think it's because <laughs> uh, I give them good stuff. And li- now I'm finding that they're actually listening, they just don't want to talk to each other, which is unique, because yeah. they're all basically competitors. But last week, I, you know, I talked about, I'm doing some, some take your business online, you know, go from offline to online, and all of a sudden I'm getting you know, dozens of emails about, yeah, I'm in, I want to do that, I have to do that. It's interesting, like, they know that the principles that I'm gonna teach are found in books. Yeah. You know, it's not a technology driver, right? Not necessarily. Uh, you know, Collins talks about don't chase technology too much. Use it like a like a like a like a golf club to hit a ball, but don't change clubs all the time because there's a better one. You'll see that a lot, right? With the Church of What's Happening Now app to do the same thing that the one you already had and know how to use is doing. Right? Yeah, big misconception. A lot of people think uh, um, tech is what defines a company. Yeah. You know, and he starts talking about like. All the like IBM didn't have the best technology when they started. A lot of big companies didn't. And when he interviewed all the great CEOs and asked mm-hmm. them to list their five things that made their company successful, 80% of them didn't even include technology. It's um, core values, probably, in people. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And then you build up the technology as it comes. Who was, who was, um, Oh, this is going to come to me. Walgreens. Oh, drugs.com, drugstore.com. Yeah. There was, uh, during the online bubble, um, this company, either drugs.com or drugstore.com, drugsonline.com. And everyone was like, well, this is the end of Walgreens. Right. And Walgreens didn't panic. They were confident in what they were doing and their mission. And they did improve their tech and they did improve their online capabilities. Mm -hmm. Um, but they did it methodically and in a disciplined manner with time. And obviously that, whatever that is, it's not Walgreens. Um, so he really speaks to that. You have to stay true to who you are, your company, your identity, your mission, and then use your great people and your resources to do what's required and, and to, you know, let the technology support your mission and uh that's important because i i looked at that wrong you know i yeah. always think you hear about current stuff and we were talking you know this this book's old now um i don't what 15 years at least i'm i think about that maybe more so so i don't know given the rapid change in technology like wh- how that varies um but like i would see the netflix and, and all these companies and just think you know technology is what makes or breaks the company and he says absolutely not in so. 19 years, um, you still won't get those extraordinary results without good leadership, level five leadership, having the right people in the right focus, making sure they're real about their, the, you know, these are all the principles, you know, focus on one thing and discipline. You still need those non-technical attributes to be successful. Yep. 
in my mind. Uh, in a restaurant, like we're not in restaurants anymore. But one, if you ever eat a restaurant with me, I'll always ask the waiter or waitress, what are you known for? And I know whether or not I have a trained waiter then. Because a restaurant should be known for something. Have you ever been to a restaurant with all kinds of food? Like it's like they're not really good at anything. Or you go to an Italian place and you go, you got to try our meatballs. They go right. they like right, they light up. Like oh, thank God someone asked me. The meatballs are the best. They're the best meatballs in the world. It's a classic example where they're good at something and everyone's around it and the discipline to promote it. That's when you scream at them and tell them they're not a hedgehog. <laughs> right, like you got no hedgehogs. <laughs> You're not a oh, hedgehog, man. <laughs> um, I liked when he talked about the disciplined businesses but he gave comparisons like they could have a whole disciplined operation from the outside looking in but you that doesn't mean you have a tyrant as a leader that's just beating you down with discipline it has to come from the people and you make the people disciplined first but on the surface it looks the same but you have to have to come from within like it has to come as a culture instead of just someone telling you to be disciplined it's like a sports team in the media i was gonna go there too were you <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like what's what's this and are you getting along with it? it's like Look, we're good inside. We know what's going on. We're uh, or what? What's the what's the Belichick? Do your job. Do your job. We're on to next week. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can't get six words out of that guy. Talk about a guy <laughs> who's a hedgehog. Right? I love that. Well, they're a big deal that you can watch. Everyone's going to watch. Like, is it Tom Brady or is it the system? We'll see. I right. think it's both. Like, like anything, the answer usually is somewhere in the middle. But he he brought a kid when Brady got hurt. He brought a kid in, and the kid's a quarterback for the the Forty ers now. Like, very talented person. So it's very difficult. But in, in cases of great teams, like, you'll see these great players, like Rick Jordan and Kobe Bryant and Relentless that we, that we looked at. Then you see these great coaches, like uh, Davis, Lombardi, Nick Saban, Bill Belichick. You know, there, it's a really interesting management. You know, it's a combination of having the right leader and the right people on the bus, wrong people off the bus. I think yeah. that's a really good analogy in sports. I love how you put it. Like, it doesn't matter when you're talking, what industry you're talking, those principles will always be there. You know, they're, they're fundamental. Never before has this level of research given a as near possible scientific explanation as to why these companies do well, a replicatable process, seven of them, mm-hmm. versus the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that in the same environment didn't. Like, these are timeless like we apply these today and you keep applying them. Anytime something's going wrong, step away and look at these principles. Do I got the wrong people in the wrong place? Are we losing track? Are we losing our discipline? Are we drifting from our core values? Are we chasing the envious technology others have? Like yeah. Berkshire Hathaway has that, that, uh, that discipline, right? You know, Charlie and Warren Buffett aren't chasing technology stocks. They're not technology people. You know, they stay, they stay, they, they, they eat at their own restaurants. They, they do what they know what they do. They're growing rich in a niche. They have a don't do list and that guides them. Yeah. What not to do. It's kind of interesting. These disciplines that Jim Collins writes about are, are we're already spoken about at like 10 different times in our books that we've already, already reviewed. That's why this is an easy book to talk about. What do you think? Should we set up next week here? Yeah, we got any more questions? Uh, uh, yeah, we have some more questions, actually. Want to take one more? Sure. Yeah, sure. I also have one fact that we did not talk about that I have to bring up. Go for it. The flywheel, which is that there's no breakthrough. It's just constant work. We did touch on that people right. like have the breakthrough or like they only see, they don't see the things that are going on behind the scenes. But he talks about the flywheel pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And then as soon as it builds momentum and acceleration, the energy you put into it starts to fuel your own energy. Mm. And people don't see that. They see the breakthrough. They want to see what happens, but they don't see the people pushing it consistently, nonstop working on that. I love that one. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the, uh, it's a little bit like the domino effect. Pretty soon these very large... It starts off with something very small and redundant and it takes time to build up. So you have you know, process, build up, build up, build up, and then pop, you know, breakthrough. You get a, like, it's a, you know, it's a book about it called The Tipping Point. It's like hard to get something to the very top. And when you can't push it anymore, you just give it a little more effort and, and it takes over. Momentum. Cool. All right. I have a, uh, okay. I'll take one quick question. Sure. It says, in what ways can we make our mindset instilled with greatness? What ways can we make our mindset instilled with greatness? Wow, that's a blank canvas type question. 
Um, well, in this book, the Stockdale Principle, the Stockdale Paradox, you know, it's um, it's contrast, big thing and little thing. And so your mind, you have to know and trust yourself. Like a big part of life is just trusting that you won't let yourself down. You know, so trusting that the big picture, I'll succeed. I'll be the best. I'll make it happen. And way down in the weeds, understanding what's going on around you, being real, being pragmatic. When you lose or you fall on your face, having the courage to really dive in and look at the pieces and analyze it and understand why. Mm. Um, so that you can continue to get better as you march and you take those little steps towards the big solution that you know exists. So um, I think if we're talking about context from this book, that's what I would say. I would, I would combine the hedgehog principle from this book. Once you decide what you could be the best in the world at or your team could be the best in the world at, then you to take one from... Uh, how to win friends and influence people. You give yourselves that reputation to live up to. Mm -hmm. You promote it. You talk about it. You say, I'm this. We are that. We're the best at this. We can help you do that. We can solve this problem. And then you, you just live it passionately and, and be real. But that's, you know, mindset is everything. Nice. And that's our product. All right. So we'll wrap up with next week's book, we're going to do Talking to Strangers, which it is on the bestsellers list. We're all big fans of Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know this book, or you guys might even know more. I don't even know what I it's about. I read it. I didn't even know I owned it until <clears throat> Steve found it in a shelf. <laughs> yeah. I must have. I think Ty Lopez recommended that book, and I just haven't read it yet. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm pumped. I mean, I've read Outliers. I thought it was fantastic, and this is uh, very high up on the New York Times bestsellers list, or it was as of last week. So. What's the subheading to it? Um, what we should know about the people we don't know. Oh, it's so good. Try knocking on doors for a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Knock on doors. Right. Well, right now you can't do it, but you learn a thing or two doing that. <laughs> not, not as much as you think. I, if I was more aware, I, you know, I wasn't as aware as then as I was now, I'd used to get pissed off and take everything personally when I really, really should have just trusted in the process that after a while, someone's going to need what you're, what you're, there's, what you're selling or what you're asking to help them with. But, uh, I don't know what the, I mean, I'm excited to read this book because I like, I like the concept. I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uncertainty when you want to meet new people and break out of your little social circles yeah. to try to grow, particularly in leadership. You're going to be in leadership or you're going to be building and leading teams. I'm think I'm hoping, uh, that this book will shed a little light on team building maybe. We'll find out. We'll be back with uh, talking to strangers next week. If you are around and you're quarantining or social distancing, read it with us. Check it out. Ask us some questions, and uh, it'll be fun to, to get even more people involved in this conversation, like a, a little little book club here. Because um, I said this last time, and, and it continues to be more and more true. This A book a week for me is becoming a secondary education. It's the best decision I've ever made. And if you have the capacity to, to join us in that, that pursuit, I'll call it, uh, well worth it. So, uh, you want to drop the numbers? Yeah, sure thing. Text us at seven, five, four, two, seven, three, six, zero, six, nine. Just text us just like you would any other phone number. All right. See you All next right. week, guys. Take care. <laughs>